So I recently spent one of my days off in the shop working on a couple knife blades. And this one I actually put together and got the handle on with some red liners. And it's pretty much ready to go. It's not sharp yet. Uh, because I don't like to sharpen them until after I make a sheath farm. So that's what I'm going to work on today. Um, is going ahead and making a sheath for this. I've got a piece already marked, a piece of leather, with the pieces that I'm going to need. But I go over the pattern a little bit here with what I'm planning on doing. Obviously patterns like normal are based on uh, the shape of the knife blade. Uh, and then you add on enough around the outside edge that's going to be your welt spacer piece. And that's where your stitch lines are going to be. So you need to add enough for a seam allowance. Uh, this one's going to retain the knife by going up over it and kind of wrapping around. So you have to make sure that it's wide enough up there to uh, wrap around the blade or the handle at that point. Um, now the oddities about this sheath is that it's going to be what's called um, a frog and sheath. It's not actually a frog sheath because a frog is actually a piece of leather used to attach something like a knife sheath or a sword scabbard or something like that to a belt. Um, so bayonet frogs, sword scabbards, going frogs, so on and so forth. So yeah, there's going to be a little piece here that's got a couple holes in it that are going to be for the belt loops. And it's got a couple slots here that this uh, knife sheath or knife scabbard is going to slide through. And then instead of putting a button stud or something on the sheath to hold it into the frog, I decided to put a couple little ears on it like I've done on holsters in the past and those should lock it into place. We'll see how well that theory works out as I make it. old piece of leather from my scrap bin about nine ounces thick not planning on lining this sheet so I decided to grab something a little bigger but like I said it's been in the scrap bin a while kind of dried out and it's gotten pretty tough to cut And when that's the case, sometimes it helps to go back and just take a strop and polish up your blades a little bit. And I found this is true of whether you're using a round knife like this or if you use a utility knife to cut a piece. Even a utility knife can sometimes benefit from a little bit of work on a strop. Believe it or not, even if it's a fresh blade, stropping it and polishing it can really make it cut a little bit better. If it just is polished more, it glides through the leather a little bit better. A little bit smoother cut, and you're not catching, and it um, it's when it catches and then all of a sudden slips, it's when you make mistakes. When it cuts through nice and smooth and just kind of glides through, it makes life a lot easier. And it has a little bit to do with the sharpness of your blade, but a lot to do with the polish of your blade. And one last thing to finish while we've got the knife out to cut. So I'm going to punch the holes and cut out these pieces for these slots in it. And 
And I'm sure I've mentioned before, but another thing that benefits a lot from being polished is your hole punches stop sticking in the leather. Either you can just use them a bunch of times and the leather, as you punch through it, will polish it. Or you can strop it or take it to a polishing wheel. Yeah. This is the way things are going to lay out. Now, I thought about leaving the tab only on one of these and not on the other. And that might be the way to do it. Because it might wind up too thick otherwise. Um, I just don't think I'm going to be able to bend that tab and get it in there. But I might. But anyway, let's go ahead and cut one of those off. We'll cut it off of the top one. The bottom one's more likely to catch. One more piece, I need my welt slash spacer piece still. I don't have that marked yet. All right, now for this, I've got another piece that basically it's the same as my front piece um, that I cut for the sheath. And I'm just going to use a scratch all where I've got these lines marked for the edge of the blade and I've kind of curved them out a little bit so that it opens up some. And I'll just mark along by punching some holes through there. And let's go ahead and punch a hole down here at the bottom. Just to make life a little easier on cutting it out. spacer piece and your spacer should be a piece of leather about as thick as your blade is thick um, it doesn't need to be super thick piece it's just enough to add some in there and that keeps the blade from going uh, into your stitching basically um, if you make it too thick it can let the blade wobble around too much and rattle and of course if you make it too thin you're gonna have to shape the sheath a little bit more to the blade or it could of course, once you shape it, open it up enough that your edge can get to your stitches, which is, again, what you're trying to avoid. Now let's go ahead and bevel some edges. Put some stitching lines in. And then we should be good to start doing our actual decorative work. Now, unusual for me is I'm not lining this, in this case. Um, you could technically line these pieces so they're smooth on the inside against the knife. You could line this piece so it's smooth on the back, where the person's going to see it. Um, at least the person that's buying the knife. While they're wearing it, of course, that's going to be against them. And that may or may not be a selling point, is to have it smooth. Some people want it rougher so that it doesn't slide around. And other people want it smooth because they just like that nice finished look. But it's a lot more stitching if you do it uh, aligning. Because you've got to stitch around all these loops basically and all the way around the outside edge to keep it from separating uh, from the lining. Okay, now as usual, I'm going to put a stitching groove just around where this uh, is going to stitch on the front here. So that's just going to be where my spacer is. 
and where the stitch line is going to be for that. So I'm just going to kind of mark a spot up here, line it up on that side, and mark a spot over here. And my stitching groups are just going to go from those. If you're hand stitching, you can mark one on the back of this too, and then try and punch all your holes the same. Um, or you could just punch or drill your holes through and then come back and put your stitching groove on. I'm going to machine sew it, so I really don't bother with it on the back. Uh, I use a lighter thread on my machine for the bobbin thread, and that pulls up into the leather more, so I don't have to worry about it as much on the back. The heavier thread that I use is my top thread. Um, I've got the stitching group for. And like I said, I would be doing stitching groups all around this if I was lining it. Since I'm not, it can pretty much get left alone. Um, I'll probably put something around them with just a, a crease line or something just to um, add something to it. Now these aren't really being finished up yet, but sometimes it helps while it's wet to go ahead and shape these uh, edges. Kind of smooths everything out a little bit. So it'll round out and smooth out a little bit better later on. All right, now I'm going to do a similar pattern to what I did on my uh, brown knife case. I'm going to do a uh, meander pattern like that. And I did an example piece, a little bit of what I want to try to do uh, with a block dyeing technique. There's probably a video out there on that already. Or at least by the time I'm putting this video out there should be. But anyway, let's go ahead and mark some lines. We're going to go in a little bit from our stitch line. And we're just going to use a wing divider to mark a line parallel to the edge there. Then we're going to use the meander tool to make some little shadow marks. That's how I always do this. To get the spacing right. And I'll go to those marks with the tool, or with the wing divider now. Make a second line. Right now, while I've got the wing divider out, I'm going to use it as a creaser and just kind of go around all of these Let's get about halfway point on that. And then I'm probably not going to do any actual tooling on this frog. Um, If I did any tooling, it'd probably be right across here. Um, because this part's more than likely going to be covered up by the belt going through. This part's going to stick out in front of the sheath. Alright, and I've done a video before on this meander tool. So we're probably going to cut to a little bit higher speed version of this for the sake of time. Now 
unlike normal, I'm going to bevel around this so that I wind up with, when I block dye this, um, the red kind of fading out on the outsides of it. Otherwise, it's going to be dark right up to this, and then this is going to be dark, and I won't have that layer of contrast in there. So I have to bevel it down. Now I'm going to put the uh, background texture in the center. Like I said, it's kind of a little tool. Looks like it's got little craters in it, like the moon. But like I said, I think the pattern it makes looks more like lizard skin than anything else. stamped. Time to go ahead and dye this. Let's get it dyed the color I want it to be. It's going to be first a coat of red and then we're going to block dye over it with a, a really dark color called Cordovan. At least when Phoebe's called it Cordovan it's really dark. Other brands use different um, interpretations of that color. Now I think these two pieces I'm just going to go straight up Cordovan on not gonna matter. This piece I'm gonna do the red and then the cord of them. And I want to make sure I flood it in there really good because I want it to be down in these impressions. I want it to be red. Alright, so I cut away and now that I've got a chance to let this dry. At least, mostly dry. I've got my block of wood wrapped up in some cloth here. Uh, this is just a an old bed sheet. It's wrapped around twice. So, it's a pretty thin cotton cloth. And we're going to use that to block dye this. The block of wood is where the block dye name comes from. But yeah, then that's just going to highlight by just getting on the parts that are still raised. And making those darker. Then the rest of the stuff, I'm just going to straight up dye quarterman which is this really dark reddish brown. It's got kind of a purplish reddish color to it. But it's so dark it's almost black. And actually I've learned this technique from several other leather workers and it showed up in some books to use block dye, usually not with this two-tone effect. Um, this two-tone effect I basically learned from a local leather worker named Joyce Lagrange who unfortunately has passed on, is no longer around, but she taught it at a guild meeting. Um, so I always try to give credit for anything like that. If I can remember who taught it to me, to let say who actually taught this to me and where I learned it from. And Joyce uh, was also the one that taught me about using um, the Cordovan for this color instead of black because it turns out being very similar in appearance when it contrasts with another color but black doesn't cover the same way the cordovan covers better and makes a better finish whereas black you'll wind up with these kind of grayish streaks instead of a good black sometimes on it all right a little bit of acrylic resoline for a finish it's going to pick up some of this red probably on the first coat of these deep impressions. So we'll just go ahead and put that on there. 
and wipe off some of the pink that it picks up. Then the second coat doesn't really pick up any red. So, good to go, won't come off on people. And if you kind of have a paper towel around to sort of polish up resiline a little bit, uh, you can get streaks and bubbles and things that it might leave sometimes uh, cleaned up right away. Give yourself a better finish. Something I don't do a lot, uh, but resiline can be buffed as well. Like a lot of leather finishes, almost all of them have an element of some sort of wax or something in them that you can buff them up a little bit. Or of course you can take them to a buffing wheel rather than just using a canvas scrap like this. Which I may do on the end on this anyway because I think this is going to look good with kind of a buffed up finish on it. Oh, you know what? I should put some dye on that too. If it was further down in the sheet, it wasn't something that's going to basically be hanging open. Wouldn't need it. Let's go ahead and put some dye up here as well. At least until it gets further down into the sheet like this. Now, on the back of that, I'm going to put some of this tokenol finish on it. It can be used for edges, of course, but it can also be used for smoothing up the back of a piece of leather. So we're going to throw some of that on there. See how that works. Lock that die in because it's basically wax-like. And this is basically an option besides lining a piece. Is to burnish the back with a, a, a burnishing compound like tokenol, which is... Um, a Japanese made sort of cream really um, I'm not sure it's any better on edges than gum dragon canth I don't actually think I like it as well on edges but on the back of a piece it's really good there's probably a better way to apply it. Um, it doesn't seem to hurt my fingers, so I just use my fingers. And just like gum tragahanth, it works best if you let it, put it on and kind of let it dry a bit. Put it on a nice thin coat of it. Let it, what will soak in, soak in, and then dry. And all a glass burnisher is, is it's a, it's a piece of plate glass with rounded edges that's used to smooth out pieces of leather. Um, I use it after I do basket weave a lot of times and other such patterns to flatten it out. Not a necessary tool. Anything flat and smooth with rounded edges would probably do just as well. Technically then, the frog, that piece that would attach to the belt, is finished. That's all you really need to do. Finish up the edges on it. No stitching required. Just slick the back, finish it up. The knife sheath, on the other hand, now that it's had a chance to put this burnishing gum to dry a little bit, Time to glue it together. The one side, of course, already rough because it's the flesh side of the leather. But the grain side, we're going to go ahead and rough up with a knife here real quick. And 
and everything will glue together better. Once that's glued together, I can take it downstairs and stitch it, which I may just do off camera this time around. And I'll grind these edges to match. Then I'll come back up and finish edges, and then this should be just about done. Okay, got it stitched and sanded, we'll touch up some edges, should be good to go. I did have one stitching oddity with my machine. It, it skipped one stitch there. I'm not happy with that, but it's not enough to tear it out and try again. But otherwise, almost done with this one. One thing about this particular style of dyeing, where you block dye over top of it, is as this wears and bends and moves, your base color starts to show through more. Um, so it gets a really nice weathered effect. Like an oil pull-up type leather sort of effect going to it over time. And the knife fits in it, which is really important. So like I said, technically this part is the sheath. And this part is the frog. And they are two different things. And you could change out different sheaths between that frog. Uh, but this one particularly is made for that one. So let's see if I'll be able to put it together. So those tabs keep it from sliding up or down out of there. And it takes a good bit to put it together. So it should take quite a bit to pull it apart. Now make sure that our sheet gets shaped to it. <laughs> 